Hey, Lou. Okay. All right. It's getting better, better, a little better, all the time. I can't get no I have to admit, it's getting better, better. it's getting better, since you've been mine. And now, 1160 AM KBDT proudly presents Life Solutions, Coaching, Counseling, Naturopathic Medicine, Insights for Successful Living, and Getting Better with Ann Beal. We are excited today. We have a wonderful author named Lewis Campbell. We call him Lou. He is a good friend, and he has come out with another book. He has over 50 books. Um, This new one, I think it might be our favorite. It's called Texas Rising, and it is all about the emerging of Texas in the 1880s, 1800s. Yes. And it's got trail riding, cowboys, Interesting cattle. and unusual stories. And that's one of Lou's very best features is he takes uh, uh, real life vignettes and experiences uh, either of his own or, or that he has read about, heard about, and people he knows. And he puts them together in the most entertaining, interesting uh, way in his books. And so Texas Rising is one of those and a little bit different from some of the other books that he has done it is and you know if you are quarantined in or sheltering in or you love to read this is we enjoyed it so much i just finished it yesterday and uh it was a nice escape and it also visited all the areas that you and i being in the cattle ranching families yeah the slaughters and the beals um there were a lot of locations in it and things about it that we just loved if you've never read about that um the um Forgotten Cattle King talks about the Beale family and the Slaughter family and the ox shears and all the cattle ranchers back then. But Texas Rising was a cl- is a collection of stories. But um, we I think our favorite was the first one. And so we have Lou here to join us. Welcome to the show, Lou. Are you there, Dr. Lou? Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay. Hi, how are you? We are, we are good. It's so good to have you. And... Uh, We've been uh, putting out some information about the show today, and all of our listeners are really looking forward to hearing from you. Well, I appreciate that. Now, Lewis, you have classes where you teach people how to write as well, because after reading this book, uh, you know, I thought, gosh, you know, it'd be so great for people quarantining in um, in this time to write their memories or to write about the quarantine or to just write their book that they, I mean, they say everyone has a book in them. Would you agree? Well, I agree with you, and I agree with that that concept, too. Uh, the more you read, the more you increase your vocabulary, and the more you fertilize your imagination. But the basic idea is to communicate, and life's experiences are not all happy. Certainly all this business of being quarantined and and being anxious about where, what, uh, where the income is going to be coming from, it's really all part of life. And my bride and I have traveled around the world in many different contexts. And what we take for granted here in our country is totally unknown in most of the rest of the world. So when we're inconvenienced, that's only a minor point, especially if you realize what's happening in the rest of the world. Now, I'm off the track a little bit. But the bottom line is to, to, to be able to communicate and, and personally to be able to find other people, especially older people, who've lived it. And they're really quite eager to talk about it, but nobody seems to be prepared to listen. Well, and I think, Lou, when I, you have such an incredibly rich background being in classical theater and mime and being a director for classical theater for like 50 years all around the world. We were talking about the theaters you've designed in different areas mm-hmm. around the world and all the different countries you've lived in. You are definitely a person that knows what you're talking about when you say that about other countries. It also gives you this rich background for writing and I think a lot yeah. of people could be intimidated by that because they don't have that. But yet what your whole class that you have in Granbury teaches 
it's a writing clinic for getting things down on paper, no matter what about you, anything about your life and your memories, and you share how to do that. Exactly. And like I said, in one case, uh, in, from my personal experience, I had the opportunity. Uh, my mother lived to be 90. Mm-hmm. She passed away years ago, but uh, when she was 87, I had the opportunity to interview her with a cassette tape recorder. You don't even see those anymore. I went up and interviewed her, and I said, Mom, I want you to tell me about your life. And I just said, I'm going to put this recorder down here on the coffee table between us. Just ignore it. It'll pick up, pick up the voices. So I started out and said, what's the first thing you remember when you were a kid? And she thought for a moment, and she said, I remember the factory whistles and the, and the boat whistles going off. She grew up, she was born and raised in Brooklyn. And she said all these whistles were going off, and it was a celebration of the armistice of the First World War. Yeah, Nobody that. talks about that anymore. <laughs> right. No, but, but it's, <clears throat> it's great that you got to ask her about that. You know, I asked, yeah. I did a writing with my grandmother, and she was talking about before electricity, and then when they got electricity, and then when right. they got their first car, the, when cars started, and airplane. It was such an incredible thing to write about and people just don't realize that their life has so much in it and we just actually got my dad a book like that where he could write about his life and Mm -hmm. um we would just really encourage everyone to do that and when i look at you have put out so many books and you tell these stories for texas rising you did a lot of research about texas didn't you yes well of course i lived a lot of it uh some of it interestingly came about just by traveling through an area and knowing what happened years ago when our girls were still with us. Our, our youngest is now 43. Um, but when they, when they were with us in the car, we traveled a lot by car. And we'd come across these signs, historical marker ahead. I remember <laughs> the youngest one said, here comes another hysterical marker. <laughs> well, some of them were hysterical, but... Uh, I usually would tell them before we got there what it was about, and they were kind of amused by that. In some cases, we wouldn't even stop because they were so amused by me telling them about what that was. Mm. And we had the occasion to trace the Oregon Trail, for example, and it's still available, but who cares? Only people who are interested in reading. And, of course, some of my books and some of the more popular books are the old westerns. I have had one critic say that uh, it's like a, a Louis L'Amour re, reincarnated. Well, I wouldn't presume that. Uh, he was a magnificent writer. I read a lot of his work and a lot of Zane Gray and obviously a lot of Shakespeare and a lot of Tolstoy. Uh, I read a lot. Well, in this and, book, in this book especially, Texas Rising, you have yes. Fort Worth on my mind is one of the first chapters. Yes. And the yes. areas that you're talking about are Fort Worth back in the 1800s. And you talk about Main Street. You talk about Hell's Half Acre, the Exchange right. Street, the livestock pens, the stock exchange. Right. Yeah, a lot uh, of these places still exist. Yes. You know, down there. They we, do exist. And yeah. That's part of what provoked my imagination to go into the old stockyards mm-hmm. in the north part of Fort Worth. Yep. It's all a very big tourist trap. Yes. And they have an uh, amazing amount of information readily available. Yeah, they really you do. You have to dig yeah. a little bit. But you, when you look at the buildings there, and look, this building was built in 1893. It says right on the building. Yes. Right. On right. the cornerstone. Well, what happened in 1893 to make it? Uh, will make them want to have a building like that. Mm-hmm. And it's still not only there, it's occupied. Going down uh, to Cowtown is one Cattle of the... Cattleman's Hotel is a great example. Yes. You're going there in the, in the lobby of the hotel, there is a very nice, elegant, old furniture, very durable, and a cage, which is the registration area. And one thing ominously not visible is any television anywhere in the lobby. Yeah, that's, that's good. Because that's how it used to be. And guess what? People actually have to talk to each other. Well, they do talk to each other simply because of the environment. Now, what does that say about our current world where families don't even eat at the table anymore? They're all, they're all locked into their cell phones or they're all watching TV. 
And no wonder we're becoming, uh, we're downgrading our culture simply because of that kind of behavior. Well, when you start reading this book, in um, the first chapter talks about Clyde Curry. Mm -hmm. Clyde Mm -hmm. Curry was finally finished. He had delivered the herd of the widespread of West Texas desert and into the sprawling Mm -hmm. cattle pens of the Fort Worth stockyards. With their new slaughterhouses on the hill bidding for any livestock they could get, the burgeoning cities in the east had many hungry mouths, and even the military required much beef. Mr. Greenleaf W. Simpson from Boston had come west to realize his vision and offered 50 cents per pound on the hoof, more than the Mm -hmm. other slaughterhouses in the business. So the price for cattle raising had finally risen to a livable wage now. And you go on and you talk about uh, he walked up the exchange street from the livestock pens to the Fort Worth Stockyards Exchange and Hotel Building, satisfied with Mm -hmm. his work and the promise that Jim Dunham would meet him that evening to finalize the sell. And you actually talk about a bank that's still in Fort Worth. And I, 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 um, I, because of definitely my background with my family, I love this. I love this story. And I noticed that you have other books where you've written about Colorado and different places in Colorado. And I've read those and there was a time, I think that was Paradise. The first one was called your other Paradise series, Paradise Remembered, Paradise, all those books. They were so well, good, and you tied. Series, yes. And each book has 25 short stories that are actually true. And you well, tied these to that because they're going they're going to take the herd from Fort Worth to Colorado. And so you yeah. go all the way through Texas um, in the, um, which I love that you used, uh, what's his name? What's his name? Light, 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 uh, the cattle man. Oh, my gosh. Uh-huh. You used his trail and uh, loving. Oh, oh okay. okay. Well, yeah. you talk the about Chisholm Trail. trail. You talk about the good night loving say, trail. Oh, why in the world is he doing that? The, the good night loving trail, trail, yeah. Was the good night loving trail. Charlie Goodnight and Loving developed a trail that went from Fort Worth down to Pecos, which is 400 miles southwest, in order to take the cattle up to Colorado. But the reason they did that is because the Pecos River flows up from the Gulf. It doesn't flow, it flows down to the Gulf, but going to Pecos, the city, the town, yeah. and going upriver, they would go by, past Fort Sumter in, in uh, New Mexico, where there was a large population of Indians that were peaceful but were relying on the military for food and beef. And then they would keep going all the way up the front range to Denver. That was the original trail. Yes, uh, and you know, good night. Decides, well, why don't we just cut up the Brazos? Well, and I if know. You know your history. You would know that by that time, there was a lot of fences up around Lubbock. He said, "I'll go up the Brazos and cut over to the Canadian, and I'll save all these four hundred miles." Well, you you saw what happened. In yes. The book, so. And you know, Charles, good night is an incredible. There's so much incredible cattle history for Texas. There, we, you can go to the Goodnight Ranch on your way to Wichita, yes. Wichita Falls, or on the way to uh, um, Albuquerque, even when you're cutting through Amarillo. Yes, and right. so you can go see that. And he also uh, experimented with um, hybrid herds that would do better in Texas. And so it's it right. was really cool. And Loving, his daughter, the Goodnight's daughter, married Loving, Mister Loving. And so they joined uh-huh. together in the cattle business. And so I was reading, I recognize so many of these people, but it's just great that you wrote about Texas history that way. And it's such an enjoyable read. And I just encourage people to get the book, Texas Rising, uh, the historic fiction of the great state of Texas. And I know for your, your original title, you wanted it to be emerging Texas or something. You know, it was Texas emerging yeah. from the 1800s. And um, it is such a good story. Now, Lou, when we come back, we want to help people know how to write these memories for themselves. And I know that you have a class clinic. Um, are yes. you going to be doing that online? Yes, it is online. It's online. Uh, for, the, for the most part, I have people all over, all over the world that are writing. Yes. It's not because I'm a writer. It's because I'm trying to provoke them to use what they have in their experiences and in their vocabulary to communicate the ideas that they have about their life. It's not an ego trip. I don't write for ego purposes. I write for passion. I write in spite of the fact 
that the books are not flying off the shelf anywhere. Well, let's tell them when they get back. Get them, know how to get them, and enjoy reading them. Yes, and we have to take a break and hear from our partners. When we get back, we're going to talk about this class and how to sign up for it. So stay right here so you can hear Dr. Lou teach you how to write your memories. That's okay. You look really put out. Well, I think it's probably better than you guys. Just... Yeah, I just was, had a thought going about good night, mm -hmm. and I couldn't think of his name. I was trying to tell you. But that's well, you okay. said Chisholm Trail. But then I said good night, Bubba. Yeah, but he was, anyway. all I was saying is he was talking okay. the whole no, I time get it. I get it. underneath. I don't think he can hear us as well or something because I don't could know. Be. You know, and I was like, uh-oh, I didn't mean to do that. Are you there? I'm here. Okay, good deal, good deal. I'm going to turn this one of the things. One of the other things, you can go up now by Nakona. There is a big cut. It looks like a bulldozer went through there, and it's where the Chisholm Trail cut over the Red River. And it's still there. It's millions of cattle went down this slope and banged it down. It looks like a great big bulldozer went down there. Where's from all the cattle that went down there and cut across? It's still there. Now you it's said that in your Rikona. Did you say that in your story? Did you talk about that in your story? I, I mentioned it in the ones in the first story you were talking about. Yeah. The um, Fort Worth on my mind. Well, he goes up to see if he can find a ranch property up there. And uh, and uh, he comes back. He finds one, but he comes back, and then he signs on with the other herd to go make some money. Now, Lou, the next segment is only five minutes, so you'll have to listen to me if you can get uh, – if you can look. I know there's a clock in your office there. When we start yeah. back, if you can just be aware, it's a real short segment. And then the okay. next segment after that is is 15 minutes, so we have okay, more time. Good. And so if you can kind of just keep up with that so I, I, so I don't have to just kind of cut you off. But um, I thought the book was, and I know I let you know that. I got back to you and uh, emailed you and told me I really enjoyed the story immensely. Yeah, I appreciate that, yeah. Now for the class, um, how long is the class? No, it's, uh, it doesn't have a link. It doesn't have a link. It, has, it depends on who wants to write what they want to write. Oh, or if they good. want to write something about their parents or get something from them. What do they need to ask? Yeah. That summary sheet, that unfortunately I can't find my copy at the moment, was, was, was what you're going to ask me about it, and I know this stuff well enough. Uh, what is it that you look for in writing? What ignites you in writing? And not only the vocabulary to be able to communicate it, but uh, the opportunity to communicate some of those ideas. I sure wish I could find that because I sent you a copy, and at the time I copied it from me, and I left it somewhere. That's okay. And I won't worry about it, but I'm now a member of the Western Writers Association, by the way. Are you as really? As a result of this book. It's a, it's a whole association of people who write Westerns, even though that's only part of my writing. So when you go yeah. silent and you can't hear us, it's because she stops it for us to go to commercial okay. right before break. And yeah. so we'll be able to talk That's to you. No I, um, I know that people during quarantine, we really want to encourage them to, yeah. even if they just write about what they see, you know, there's so much that That's they right. could write. Um, even if you just look at the changes, you know, I mean, all the things that we make fun of when we go out to the store or whatever, how funny people look. But, yeah. um, okay, so she's cutting us off in just a second. Um but I really encourage people because, you know, if the mask wearing, the, the you know, going places and not seeing a soul, um, anything like that, that people see, it would be so cool if they could write about it. And that's the experiences yeah. that people well, don't just, realize that I, they're living. I just, I just had a, a good friend of mine call and said, hey, my wife and I would like to come out and go dancing with you today. I said, that's great. Come on out. But I don't okay. know if we're and now here's more Getting Better with Ann Beal on 1160 AM KBDT. Lou Campbell, the author of Texas Rising, he is helping us today. He has 50, over 50 books he's written. The Memories, Memories for Tomorrow, he is a, has a writing clinic for those interested in publishing their stories we really encourage you during this time. It would be great if you could even just write what's happening, what you see around you, wherever you live. You know, if things are ice, more isolated, if 
downtown is blank. You know, if you don't see anyone down there, or if there's masks people are wearing everywhere. I mean, we were just talking about it at breakfast, weren't we, Jim? Mm-hmm. We were. Just how strange it is. Yeah, it's a uh, it's totally different experience from what we've ever had before. So, so Lou, are you there? Hello, Lou, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, there you go. Okay. okay. I was like, where are you? Yes, okay. <laughs> so we were talking about online for you, for your class. Um, if you would like, if they would like to reach you, number one, they can just reach you at Lou. L O U at Enclave of the Arts dot org. But how an yeah. uh, Enclave E N C L A V E of the Arts A R T S dot org. How would yeah, they it sign up? Like hearts, because that's the way computers do it. Okay. It, it, Enclave of the Arts looks like Enclave of Hearts. Enclave of Hearts. org. It's an org though, not a com or not net. Yeah. So how did they sign up for your class? Well, if they write me and tell me what it is they're trying to do, mm-hmm. then I'll be able to give them an adequate quote that will assist them in, in generating it. I have uh, I have a, a fellow in, in Plano that's writing right now. Yes. And he's getting a little hung up, which is big, the biggest problem. In writing, you have to constantly write a little bit each day so that it becomes a habit. So that's if why there's no... that off till the weekend, yes. that will be very difficult because your whole mindset changes Having finished a week of work, now what are you going to do? Oh, I have to write. No, you don't. You want to write. It's a matter of a starter fluid package. What is it you're trying to do and why and to whom? So would they? You can want, they text you on your cell, or do you just want them to reach you by that. email? They could do that, although that becomes a real problem. And if they call me, I won't answer if I don't recognize them okay. because of all these robocalls. So let me say the I'm email the again, and I'll put it on the show page if you want to go to Getting okay. Better with Ann Beal. Um, so Dr. Dr. Lou, L-O-U. No, not so, dot. It's D-R-L-O-U. There's no dot after the doctor. D-R-L-O-U. Oh, you put it up yeah. here like it was Dr. Dot Lou. Okay. So oh, Dr. Boy. Lou at Enclave of the org. Mm, okay. Right. Um, and, and that's Dr. Lou Campbell. I'm interested in writing as a subject that will help me filter through and, and, uh, and I will respond. Yes, he will respond. So to start, and we only have two minutes right now to really talk about this you have the different sections that you talk about and you break it down into four parts right so it doesn't matter how big their vocabulary is or that they've never had any experience writing before we start with where they are and what will happen is they'll discover they need more vocabulary they don't need it at the moment but they could always enhance that some of the best things I've had, best responses I've had from my books is people will write and thank me for challenging them to go to the dictionary with some of the words that I use. It's not, I'm not trying to be clever or, or uh, profound, but when you communicate, even on the streets, the people that try to communicate to each other, most of the people have a, you know, phrase in there. Yeah. You know means they don't know how to communicate, am I coming through to you? So you don't write, you know, in the text. That's a good example. All you do is find what it is you're trying to say and what's the most efficient way to say it. I think most people, when they're writing a story or a book, they probably wouldn't put that. But I know for right. me, when I when I start writing, I think that's a boring word. I wonder if there's a better word for that, you know, for right. it's overcast. Oh, okay, so look up balmy or whatever. Right. Now, Jim is really good, and Dr. Slaughter is joining us. Of course, I didn't introduce you today. Is that why you've been so quiet? Oh, no, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good. I'm glad to be here as always, and uh, really appreciate you, Lou, and always enjoy talking to you, especially about your books and your writing. Well, and Jim, you know, he, uh, he has an incredible vocabulary, probably for how much he's read. I've read all my life, and it's just one of the things that I love doing, and when I have spare time, I'm uh, usually reading. Yeah. So, yeah, That's I love it. Same love as it. me. I do that same thing, too. In fact, I, I read all the time. In fact, I'm at the library down here in Granbury a good deal of the time. The people know me already down there pretty well. I don't oh, know what I'm after is usually not available. I'm usually do a, on library, a library loan book kind of thing. Yeah, and I know the the more people read, the bigger their vocabulary is because they learn right. so much. 
I um I know that for people, we just want them to get things down on paper and just to start. So when we come back from break, I want you to be able to just start telling them if you'll just start going through some of the basics of what they can do now to start writing with, right. that would be great. Okay, so stay right here and we'll start on the four sections, just how to start into your own memories. Okay. Okay, Lou. Um, yeah. On the on the class, you have the beginning starter fluid. Uh, yeah. What is your story? And so we, if we just want people to start writing, um, you say there's no length on this class. Um, no, there's no length on, on the length. It depends on the individual. Yes. The fellow I'm teaching up there in, in Plano, we he started. I, I literally offered the class down in Fredericksburg. He enrolled. And we would see one on one in a restaurant in some cases. And uh, and then eventually he got to writing. He knows what he wants to do, but he's having a hard time getting to doing it. And that's where I'm right now. I, we moved up here and he moved up to Plano. And he works up there at 9 to 5 and, uh, and sometimes weekends. So he's having a hard time writing. I said, No, you have to decide what's important. Is having a cup of coffee important? Well, it's the same kind of thing. I have a cup of coffee and I write or I read. And so it's, it's hard to help them understand what they need to do. Well, I think you, in, you encouraged Jim to start writing. I forgot about that. Yeah. He's actually the one yeah. to really get you to write your workbook, wasn't he? Right. He really talked me into uh, getting off the dime and doing something with it, yeah. Had you written it already? Right. What had you done? I had it in bits and pieces at the time, but it really needed to be reworked. In fact, there's still reworking going on. Um, But it's coming together in a different way. Lou, you and I were talking about this earlier when we saw you down in Granbury. And uh, I think it's going to be a much better work than it would have been if we just slung some stuff together earlier. Well, that's also the point that uh, if if it's going to... uh if it's going to happen, it's going to be an artifact of point of history. It will obviously mature, especially your work. Mm-hmm. Where and I understand all the issues of, of rights and uh, at proper acknowledgments and all that. Uh, you could slim it down so that it becomes more of yours and just have them refer to other information that's forthcoming. That would be, sure. that would be one way to do it. I had to decide uh, what was important to put in it and what wasn't. And there were some things right. that I uh, discarded because I knew that Although it was good material and I liked it and we use it in our right. clinic, we didn't need it in my book. So I, right. it's a it's a calling kind of thing that we do and and uh, sharpening. And uh, that's why I was saying I think it's going to be a much better work and much more helpful the way it's going to turn out this time. Well, and it's interesting. Yeah. You're right. I mean, you could refer to that, those things that mm-hmm. you were worried about plagiarizing. You didn't want to put those in there. You could always refer to them, you know, in the resources. For yeah, different things and, they and that's do. a good way to, to do it, uh, refer the reader to whatever it may be. Because Jane you know? referred to strength finders, and she mm-hmm. referred to different diagnostic tests people could go take. Mm-hmm. That's an idea. Yeah, that's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, way to go, Lou. That's awesome. And that's how you help. I mean, you make these suggestions that are so enlightening just to get somebody. To, and so whatever, like with Jim, whatever was holding him up, you made new suggestions to get him kind of over that hump. Right. And, I, you know, I still and, have that material from his original thing. I, I saw where he was going. It was way too scholarly oh, for the average peasant to be reading. I don't mean yes. that in a negative way. Um, no, I hear the that. average person needs to have a reason to read it. And when you write a book, what's called the hook, I don't know if that's on that page I gave you, at the beginning you have to have a hook that pulls them into the story and leads them further. When he, for the cattle drive was finally over, if I arrived at Fort Worth and the stockyards and all the things that were fascinating to him. What is the Del Walmsley Radio Show? Welcome to the Del Walmsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Walmsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. Listen to the Del Walmsley Radio Show, Monday through Friday from 11 until noon. It takes a whole lot more effort to get something started in your life than it does to keep it moving. Del Walmsley has moved thousands closer to a great life. The Del Walmsley Radio Show is now on 1160 AM KBDT, Monday through Friday from 11 until noon. Listen and move toward your great life today. To admit it's getting better, it's a little better all the time. 
If you'd like to get better, call Ann right now. 214-810-8255. 214-810-TALK. Now more with Ann Beal on 1160 AM KBBT. You know, Dr. Lou, I really encourage people to write now because daily life looks very different now than it did four months ago. Just on a regular basis, don't you think? Yes, I think. I mean, it's true of every day, even though now it's more acute because, first of all, they have more time because if they're, if they're, I don't mean locked in their home, but if they're obliged to be at home, uh, there's only so much TV you can watch. I guess that's one of the good things <laughs> about this. Yes. People get so sick of the same crap that's on television. Yeah, there's... And they fail to realize that that's an alternative to writing, and it's a lethal alternative as far as their education. Well, and when I... you're spoon-fed on yes. television, you're given the images. When you yes. read a book, and you certainly have read a book that you've also seen a movie about, inevitably your reading of it is better than the, book, than the video or than the the film, especially if you read it first, because yes. when you read it after you've seen the movie, you say, oh yeah, this is the scene that, well, it may or may not be, it's a different interpretation of material. I think that unusual scenes are even playing out in people's homes that they could write uh-huh. about, you know, even just getting tired of searching, trying to find stuff, anything, life is just different for people, whether they're in their homes or their parks or they go to grocery stores or they just, in streets across the country, I mean, things are so different. And you're right. It's so clear now, and things are kind of sped up how severely different they are. But in general, a person's life, because you look at, you've lived, you know, 75 years, and you look at everything, all the knowledge you have based on your history to put things down on paper. But in light of everything that's gone on in this four months, I mean, people have lived what normally would have taken like 10 or 15 years for all these things right. to have evolved. I mean, look at how many books could be written just right. about the last four months. Well, and the problem is you have to discover, they say, well, I'd really like to write. Is it an escape for the individual? Or you have to ask yourself the question, what is the story that you're trying to present? And who is your audience? Who's your audience? I, I have a, another dear friend who is in the writing work back in North Carolina, and she's writing children's books, children's stories. Another one in San Antonio who's not one of my one of my clients, but she is already she's very close because she's writing this stuff already, and it's wonderful. The use of imagination, um, and you know, ultimately, what experiences do you have? I have another young lady here was only an eighth grader here in, in uh, Granbury, and she wants to write. I thought she was older, actually, because she's quite she's got quite a good vocabulary. But she's in the eighth grade, and uh, uh, she sent me her uh, the first part of her manuscript, and it's very well written, very well thought out. But there are uh, uh, other kinds of issues. What is the point of view that you're writing from? Is it a first-person point of view? Is using the word I or using the word he or she uh, becomes a third person? In some cases, it's better if it's a first person. You saw that in Texas Rising. Yeah. In some of the stories there. Some of them were not first person. Some of them were third person. But it depends on how you employ the word. Well, you had a first person from Clyde Curry's perspective. Right. Um, So you could make a character. I, I, I know that for you... You use specific locations as important for your right. story. Is that what spurred the ideas? Was You said actually being down in Cowtown spurred the idea? Well, that's kind of interesting because one of the stories in the book is called Bunsen Dutchman's Flat. And if you drive down 281 towards San Antonio from here, you don't go down 35W, you go down, you know, down 35, you go down a uh, U.S. highway. And you go through just you go through a little town of Heiko, and then halfway toward another town, well, almost to the other town of Hamilton, you're driving across this flat territory, with wide open spaces. And all of a sudden, the road dips down in this little, pretty little valley, and it's called Hidden Valley. Hidden Valley. And there's a place at the bottom of that called Dutchman's Hidden Valley. And I've driven that route for years. And I know it provoked the idea for that story about a, about a Dutchman who immigrated when the Texas was still a republic, and he 
wanted to be alone. He wanted to be a hermit. So we went up and built a place out in the middle of nowhere. And lo and behold, everybody starts coming. Uh, totally reverse what happened, but it's a, it's a comedy in that regard. So Dutchman's and Hidden Valley. The location is so, it provokes so much. And virtually all of the Paradise series in Colorado is exactly that. I don't know how it is I can remember. I'm, I don't have a photographic memory. But I do remember when I start thinking of something and all of a sudden it opens up for me. I remember that. And it's, it's reality that is recalling it. But then how do you tamper that with the vocabulary that you have? Would you suggest people add pictures? Because if you think about yes. that Hidden Valley, because I know you showed me a picture of that valley in Colorado. You showed me a uh -huh, picture uh -huh. with the mountains behind it. Yeah, and pictures right. say so much, and they add so much to a story. Well, they can, but they also limit. Because if you identify the location... A good example of that yeah. is uh, the Eiffel Tower. For people that have seen the Eiffel Tower, it's in the context of their having seen it. Did they see it on public transportation? Did they actually visit it and go up in it, go up to the restaurant on the second level, or did they go all the way to the top? Um, our, our, one of our daughters is, an, is a, a very good artist, and when she was in the ninth grade, she did a picture of the Eiffel Tower in a fog. How many people do that? They just throw out the Eiffel Tower. No, yeah. she didn't want that. She wanted it in kind of a, a hidden. And so a point of view there is it's not the tower, it's the experience. And much later, she actually experienced the Eiffel Tower. So she was drawing it from what she had seen in pictures and everything. There's no doubt that it is the Eiffel Tower because it's kind of a unique commentary in, uh, in locations around the world. Well, and I but think you see, people... Well, how, do you use it? how do you apply it? Yes. If you use too many pictures, then you might as well do a video of That's the experience, true. and that becomes a lot more expensive. Well, and I just want people to uh, start, and I want them to ignite the imagination. I know you have those four sections, the starter fluid, igniting the imagination, yeah. setting the right. story, and then the elements uh -huh. of the story. And right. so I think people get a little overwhelmed on how to do it. And when you, honestly, when you look up how to write a book, because I know with Jim's book, he's written a lot of books, but to actually start getting them published, you know, it can right. be overwhelming, like 23 steps to get to writing a book or, you know, I mean, right. there's a lot of stuff in there and you have it narrowed down to four sections and that makes right. it so much more simple. And, um, you know, if people just think plot, character, thing, rhythm, I mean, they get overwhelmed, right? And so right. I think you offering an online class to kind of help them, and there is no time. There's not like the class is like a certain amount of time. You're willing to work with them, and like you did Jim. I mean, you've helped Jim a lot, and just to give him ideas, and when he got held up and things kind of blocked him, like, you know, he didn't want to plagiarize how to use some test or something. You gave him suggestions on what to do. And I think that um, you offer that to other people. Um, what do you think, Jim? What do you think was the biggest help from Lou for you? I think it was uh, just a consistent encouragement. Lou would text me <clears throat> pretty consistently and say, um, how's your book coming? Have you published yet? This yeah, because and you, you were near publishing. to say those things, and yeah. and I was holding off. There was just something that I knew wasn't quite right yet. But you you continued to encourage me and exhort me, and and did it in a very kind way. This is your conscience speaking. This is your conscience <laughs> it speaking. Was funny. Right. And yes. so that was very very good for me. And and there were some suggestions along the way. But I think if anything, if you helped me in any way, that was the main way. Uh, just your encouragement, and I knew you were a valuable asset, and I knew that you would be there if I had questions and all kinds of things like that. So just right. walking with me through it was a big deal. That's why it can be so important for people to get on your website and to take advantage of um, of the teaching that you do. And you've been a teacher for a long time, Lou, I know. And so they would benefit right. from that. I had. A, can I ask this question, though? I was wondering, what would you tell somebody, Lou, who said, uh, who would say, I've thought about writing before, but... I just don't think anybody would be interested in reading what I'm what I wrote. Well, that's the point what I mentioned in the in the starter fluid. Who is your audience? Mm -hmm. Who would read this kind of material? I had that years ago, and I wrote some work that was about what old people think. Kind of an, uh, and and that, by the way, is included in the Paradise series. Several of those books. It's like 
going to a uh, uh, retirement center or a nursing home. Uh-huh. And people with good intentions put their family members in nursing homes because they're capable of handling them uh, medically and otherwise. But in some cases, they, they soothe their conscience by they're being cared for, even though the family itself is not caring for them. They're simply paying to have them cared for. And yet those people sit there and vegetate with other people. Many of them can't even hear. Some of them can't even see. But if you go and hold their hand and talk to them a minute, you will be overwhelmed by what they have to say and what their life was like. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take much encouragement to get a person to open up about their life. And many of the things I've learned and many of the things I've experienced and applied toward my books come from exactly that. Listen to people. And, you know, you want you want your memories written down. I know that Dr. Howard Hendricks, who's also a friend of yours, he was yes, one of my professors. A very dear friend, yes. Yes, and he was a professor with Jim. He was talking about how people, what their kids will think of them. And what did he say, Jim? <laughs> he said, your kids, your kids don't really respect uh, to any great extent the right. things you did, no matter how good you were at them. You know, you could have been right. a ball player. You could have been an actor, an author, whatever. Your kids don't care right. because it's not their life. And they just right. don't really understand until they get a lot older right. and they live through things. And I, right. I think that for me with older people, when I get the book and I start writing there they're, and asking them, like, what it, you know, what kind of music did you like when you were a kid? What what did you dress? What were your clothes like? What was your favorite TV shows when you were a kid? What did you do for fun when you hung out with your friends? And you just ask these questions and you start writing them down in these memory books, right? Their right. stories always fascinate me beyond. I'm just like, wow, that is so cool. Like my grandmother talking about they were one of the first people to get electricity and what that was right. like and changing their oil lamps to electric lamps or the first right. they had one of the first cars and what that was like and that was incredible and so you you can take stories and write books from that but i really encourage even if you're not writing a book out there just even essays and you can do essays with pictures you could you could do videos but i just encourage you to create kind of your own written piece that illustrates your life right now and if it's taking what's happening now and turning it into fiction, well, you almost don't have to. It's almost like fiction. It's almost like science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the ugly side. <laughs> it's like, what? People walk around in masks. And, you know, you think what they used to say about the year 2020, that we were all right. going to be in spacesuits and things like that. And instead, we're all wearing masks. You know, it's right. just, it could be its own kind of science fiction. But I, I think that really encouraging people to put it down because they do say that there's a book in everyone. And in your case, Lou, there were 50 books or more. You've still got oh, a long way more, to go. More, more than that. Interestingly, it was only a couple of years ago, my youngest daughter, who's a medical doctor in Fort Worth, uh, was out for dinner. And she said, Dad, would you do me a favor? I said, sure. She said, would you write your autobiography? Well, all of the Paradise series is all biographical, but it's all fiction. Mm-hmm. Because there's no such place as Paradise, Colorado. Uh, the town was up in Nero, Colorado, and it's 200 feet underwater in a, a reservoir that the government put in long after I was there. Yeah, they flooded. But it was in the mountain country. And so I, I started writing my autobiography. I'm sure everybody's thrilled and can't wait to get it. <laughs> yeah. So far, I've gotten to uh, 1977, I think it and is. I have 150,000 words. <laughs> uh, it's, it's about 400 pages. Who's going to read that thing? Well, I think I that know. there's so many cool but things about know. your life and mime. I mean, mime, yeah. doing mime and mime theater all over the country. You know, we, you, yeah. you got into mime really early on and yeah. when you're in yeah. when i'm in europe i see mime everywhere you know i think it's not as familiar yeah. to people here in yeah. this country you're right you're right because the whole idea of theater and art if it is entertainment art is not entertainment art is something deeper and richer in a person's it life is. and a lot of my writing um, i don't mean fiction i'm talking about other writing is much more uh, focused on that. And our culture, unfortunately, because of the technology that has been able to be developed in my lifetime, by the way, television started in 1949. 
That was the first network. And in 1959, I had a long stay in a hospital, a community hospital in Colorado, and there was no TV sets in the room. And well, and a colleague, not a colleague, another patient came in who was my age. He was from Denver, and he just enlisted in the Navy, and he came over to see his girlfriend before he went to basic. Hey, Lou, I'm after a break. we got to yeah. take a break. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Lou, I had to cut you off. I, I can't. Okay. I can't. Get, yeah. I would have I'm said five sure, seconds or I'm ten sure seconds. I could go down that trail. But <laughs> it, it talked about how television entered my life. I yeah. was in a hospital, and I could do nothing. By the way, I was writing at that time as an escape from being in a hospital bed, and I, they wouldn't even let me sit up. I used a bedpan for nine months, and I had to learn how to walk again when I was a senior in high school. Wow, that's kind of unbelievable. And, and you did that when you were a teenager. It's a reflection of the kind of bitterness in my life, because obviously that's all the medical people your modality of treatment for any heart condition was total bed rest. Mm -hmm. This was, I had two heart murmurs. One was congenital and one I developed because I got rheumatic fever, which is why I was in the hospital in the first place. Mm. Nowadays, you can have a heart attack and have you up walking the same day. Yeah, it's just pretty amazing. I, I think that mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that people, you know, normally you wouldn't watch binging television unless you were sick. Or something right. was wrong with you, and and I what we worry about is people being sheltering in so long, and we have clients that right. have not been out at all yet um, since this whole thing started, really, and uh, I just I worry about their health, um, right. and I I think it's a great you know you look at all the people that are on on um, YouTube that have ended up or Facebook or places like that because they are using the time sheltered in and use their imagination and they become very creative whether they're singing or writing, or they're doing things, you know, for entertainment, instead of just yeah. sitting there kind of watching something else the whole time. They're still oh, yeah, living the their worst, lives. And the worst is using a social media for a political platform. That's oh, why yeah. I intentionally don't do that on Facebook. Yeah. But better than half the people on Facebook use that to ex exuberate themselves in their current situations. Because I understand the frustration and everything, but that's not solving anything because, first of all, they're not literate enough and don't have the availability other than video clips and things on the computer to well, give them information. Yes, I think they're just passing stuff along. They read something, it upsets them, and they share it or right. something like that. Instead of creating their own world and creating their right. own excitement and entertainment and things like that, you know, there's right. so much. I mean, you you could be writing about whether everyone's lost their job or you know, uh, everyone's filing for unemployment or my friend's dad has the virus or you think of all the things that you could write about. Or in your case, what you did was you uh, you took the time to write stories that would really fill people's hearts and give them enjoyment during this time to read and kind of escape into this wonderful world of horses and cattle and trail rides. Well, that's only and one phase of my life, though. Yeah. Uh, people say, well, are you a, do you write only westerns? No. But you I did not live a, a trail ride, cattle train. What do you call those? Yeah. With the, with trail the, drive. Uh, with the uh, cook and the um, chuck wagon. Chuck wagon <laughs> and, and yeah. all of that. I did not know that Charles Goodnight created the chuck wagon. I was excited yeah, about did. that. But well, when we went through his uh, the museum where his ranch, his last ranch yeah. house was, they have one of his chuck wagons there, and yes, it was the most picture. fascinating thing. And the way you described it in your book, I love your descriptions, was just exactly like the one we saw for real on his ranch. Well, I, well, I've, used, I, I've been involved in one roundup I was in in Colorado. I was 10 years old. Okay, eight seconds. And, I was, and that was, in, that was in, that's in another book. getting better all the time now back to ann beal on 1160 a.m kbdt we were having so much fun on break talking about chuck wagon and good night charles good night cattle riding and trail riding and those chuck wagon cooks and everything um just escaping into that world of texas history um 
fiction, well, just all about what happened back in the 1800s. It's such a cool book, Texas Rising, by Lewis Campbell. Again, we just encourage you to get it. You can get it on Amazon for like 12 bucks. It's not very expensive or something like that. Uh, it's such right. a great read during this time just to take you to an enjoyable place to escape. We just read at the pool yesterday, and I was just floating around reading, just really enjoying it, loving it. Uh, it's such a great time to do that. Thank you for this writing, Lou. Uh, I think more well, than anything you. for us with our families and everything, it was this one. I enjoyed your Paradise series for Colorado. It was such a wonderful series back in Colorado, but I couldn't relate as well as I could to this one because it's Texas. Yeah, you have Brazos River well, the and Canadian. Texas. There are several others that are about Texas already out, and there's yeah. some that are combining much of the West, including Texas. Uh, I'm currently writing one that is about Texas. Again, it's about the Texas Rangers. And interestingly, the original Rangers weren't even paid employment-wise. They were paid by land. Yes. The original government gave them pieces of land for engaging in solving the, some of the medical, some of the um, legal problems they were having back in the early days of Texas. And some of the Texas Rangers were not the pure and upright kind of people you might have thought. They well, actually were uh, rather rancorous people. Some of them <laughs> had uh, legal problems themselves. They weren't like they Walker Rangers. Because they were good in what they were doing. <laughs> Yeah, I was talking about Chuck Norris, you know, Texas Ranger, Walker yeah, Ranger. Right. He does do some. He does some older ones, you know, like um, he in that TV series. He did some flashbacks to the old right. Western Rangers, right? But in general, right. it's not quite like the show. But um, right. yeah, I actually really enjoyed your writing because it tells you if you don't know a lot about Texas history and you want to be proud to live here, you know, it's really cool to go back and see all the things that happened. And you have the first bank draft that happened there, open in the first right. bank account uh, in the bank. And it's, it's an interesting idea. And people thought it was weird. I mean, Clyde, the guy that you have in this story, he couldn't quite understand where they were telling him that they would put it on credit and he could use it around town because he was right. carrying his money on him. That's why they all had weapons. Right, is right. they had their money on them that they made all the time. They carried it with them. They weren't going to leave it anywhere. And so, you know, one of, and one of the other issues in the, one of the stories called "Unarmed and Extremely Dangerous." Yes, about a woman sheriff, and she doesn't have to carry a weapon because everybody respects women, and also respects the law. And in that story, there's a reference to a man who's called a buffalo soldier. Anybody have any idea what a buffalo soldier is? Sure it's do. A black person. Yep. No, I didn't and know that. that you read that story. Solved the I have problem I... with a quartermaster that came to town, and uh, and he solved it. And I just mentioned it in passing. It's not promoting Afro Americans or Mexicans. I have all kinds of people in my life and in history. They were just like the woman who needed a pelt. Well, hold on, she, hold she on, Lou. Hold on. I have home, I have to ask you a question though about this female uh -huh. sheriff. Okay. Because uh, Jim was telling me a little bit about that, and I said, did you find that from history? Because I've never heard of a female sheriff, or did you make that yes. up? Oh, no. There are female sheriffs really? in Texas and in Montana. There were a couple of big big names, and you didn't put up any crap there. Was... They were armed. This one, intentionally, I had her unarmed because everybody else around her respected the law. And by the way, that's the one where I introduced the old the old-fashioned tiller steering vehicles that That's came right. around before the turn of the 20th century. They weren't readily available, but remember, we're talking about the age when railroads were functional. There were a lot of things technologically happening. And so that's one story I use that. I'm not really on. fond of some yeah. of those because the old ride on a wagon or on a horse, is, and I love that. I love riding on horses, and I love working with horses still. Well, Lou, we just we thank you it. so much for being on. We did enjoy your book. And again, there is another book out there called Texas Rising. It kind of bummed me out. Don't get that one if it doesn't say Lewis Campbell. We want you to get the one by Lewis Campbell, Texas Rising, on uh, the emerging Texas in the history in the 1800s. We just want to make sure you get the right one and enjoy this reading. And um, 
Lou, is there anything else you want to share about your books real quick before we end and your class? You have um, 20 seconds. Yes, sir. I hope that I hope people enjoy reading and the one thing it can do for them. I had a quote. I put that on Facebook not long ago. 10 seconds. Uh, you, you discover you have wings when you open a book and read. Yes, you discover it's you have wings. the process of developing a theater audience one at a time. Thank I'll you, guys. Thanks for getting better. See you next week.